Now we will end with something known as batch normalization which is again almost a de facto standard at least in convolutional neural networks. So, if you are dealing with convolutional neural networks you will use something known as batch normalization. So, let us see what it is. So, this is again something which is some method which allows us to be less careful about initialization. So, let us see why that happens right. So, to understand the intuition behind this let us consider a deep neural network ok and let us focus on the last two layers h 4 and h 3. Now, typically we will use some mini batch algorithm for training right. So, we will use mini batch version of gradient descent or mini batch version of Adam or any of these algorithms right. Now, what would happen if there is a constant change in the distribution of h 3 now just think about the question that I am trying to ask you. So, as far as these two layers are concerned h 3 is the input and h 4 is the output it does not matter what has happened so far or in particular it does not matter what x was whether it came from a normal distribution or whatever distribution right. At this point my input is h 3 and my output is h 4 ok. Now, I am training it in many batches. What if across batches my distribution of h 3 looks very different what would happen is it a good thing or a bad thing it is a bad thing right. So, if you have training data right just think of this as as I said just focus on this layer. If you have an input which is not following a fixed distribution it is constantly changing during your training then that is always a bad thing right because you try to adjust to one distribution and now again the distribution is completely changing. So, that always makes your training very very difficult right. So, if you have a very fluctuant distribution then your training is going to be hard ok. So, that is the intuition that I want to build ok. So, now this could actually happen. So, it would help if the pre activations at every layer are unit Gaussians because for the input we made a case that we will make the input as unit Gaussian right. So, that things are very nice they are all coming all the inputs are coming from the same distribution, but we now realize that at every layer we have an input right. It is not that the original input is the only input even h 3 is an input even h 4 is an input and so on. So, why not ensure that at every layer your inputs or your, your h 1 h 2 h 3 also is something which looks like a Gaussian distribution which comes from a Gaussian distribution why not ensure that and that is the basic idea behind batch normalization. And how do you do that is the following that you had computed this s i k just as we had done in the derivation earlier right. So, s i k is one of these guys ok. Now, if you do this what are you actually doing you are just normalizing it right you are subtracting the mean and dividing by the variance. So, that means you are making it 0 mean unit variance and that is the intuition which I was trying to build that why not at every layer have this good distribution which is 0 mean unit variance. Now, even if you are feeding it multiple batches for that batch you will ensure that by this uh, subtraction and division or the normalization process the data will become unit uh, variance and 0 mean ok. So, now at every batch the data is coming from the same distribution even if it was originally from a distri different distribution ok fine, uh, but how do we compute this mean and variance. So, do you understand the question that I am asking I am focusing on this s i k I want to subtract the mean of that s i k how do I do that. So, the name gives it away batch normalization it cannot be more explicit than that. So, compute the mean for the current batch and the variance for the current batch and normalize your inputs or normalize the s i s according to that you get this. So, you will now end up with a situation where all your inputs at every layer across different mini batches seem to come from the same distribution is it fine the current batch. So, you take the average value from the current batch right. So, then it will become 0 mean for that batch and unit variance for that batch and this you are ensuring for every batch. So, independently every independently every batch you are ensuring that it comes from a 0 mean unit variance distribution right. So, overall the effect is that all the batches are coming from the same distribution no. So, at validation time you will compute the mean and variance from your entire data entire training data once after the training is done right ok. So, now we will compute it from a mini batch and this has ensured that across mini batches now your input always comes from a 0 mean unit variance distribution across all the layers ok. Uh, this is what a deep network will look like with patch normalization.
right? So what will happen is you passed an input, you computed this tan h, then you'll have this batch normalization layer. What is the, what is the operation that the batch normalization layer is going to do? This is the operation that it is going to do. Okay, everyone gets that. And now it gives me a unit normalized distribution. Uh, sorry, it gives me a input coming from a zero mean unit variance distribution, and then I pass it to the next layer again at a batch, no, batch normalization layer. So after every layer, you'll actually add a batch normalization layer. Now my question is: Is this legal? What is legal in this course? Anything that is differentiable, right? So we have to make sure that if we have added this operation, it should be a differentiable operation so that you can come. So now the gradients have to flow all the way here, right? So that means I should be able to compute the gradients with respect to this. So now this is one of my AIs and I should be able to compute do AI with respect to something or rather the loss, do of the loss function with respect to AI. Now it turns out that the operation that you have done is actually differentiable. You can actually work that out and it's not important. I'm not going to derive it because it's just yet another derivative that you'll take. But it's a, it should get the intuition from here, right? What you're doing is this simple operation and this just looks differentiable, right? So the operation that you're doing is differentiable. So that's why you can add these batch normalization layers and you can back propagate through this layer. But now what's the catch here? It somehow ties to the question that he was trying to ask. You are actually enforcing that all your HIs are zero mean and unit variance. So this is again some sort of a constraint that you are enforcing, right? What if that's not the best situation in which the network can learn? What if to distinguish between some classes, it was okay if the distribution was not same across all the batches? You get this? You are enforcing a certain constraint. So you are enforcing a certain condition on all the layers and all of them have to be zero mean and unit variance, but that may not always be good. So they do something which is counterproductive. Let's see what that is. Why not let the network decide what is best for it? So after the batch normalization layer, so this is what your normalized SIK was, okay? After you have done that, you compute a YK, and this is not the final output, this is the output at the kth layer, which is equal to this. Why do they do this? And remember that gamma and beta are going to be learnable parameters. What are you doing actually? You are again scaling it and shifting it, which is the same as adjusting the variance and the mean, right? So now, what happens if the network learns the following? You get back the SIK. So you had taken SIK and you had normalized it, but now if you allow these gammas and betas to be there in the network, then the network can decide that, okay, maybe at this layer I don't want this normalization. I just want to stick to whatever output I was getting. So it could learn the gammas and betas in this way and ensure that you get back the unnormalized S. How many of you get this? Fine. A lot of you don't seem to get this. But I'm pretty sure if you go back and look at it, you will get it, right? So what is happening here is that's why I said it's counterproductive. That you first forced it to make it unit mean and zero variance. And now you added, no, zero mean and unit variance. And now you added this operation which is again a scaling and shifting operation. So remember that when you make the data zero mean and unit variance, that's exactly what you do. You shift it so that it becomes zero mean and you scale it so that it becomes unit variance. So you are again introducing parameters which again introduce the same fact flexibility that you could learn gamma and beta in such a way that you could get back the original data which was not normalized, okay? So if the network wants to learn that and if the network feels that's the right thing to do, then it has the flexibility to learn those parameters, okay? And we can recover SI. Yeah, I think the rationale is that you're first making is something which is more standard, right? And then from there trying to learn it, instead of just trying to let it learn in the while. Do you get the difference between the two? You're first bringing it to all, all of these things to some standard value, which is between, I mean, which is the normal distribution. And then from there, allowing it to learn wherever it has to learn, right? So that's the idea, but it could be the case that the other thing also works, yeah. So now what we'll do is we'll compare the performance with and without batch normalization on MNIST data using two layers, okay? So here in this figure, what I'm going to draw is the uh, validation loss, or am I, no, the training loss as I keep increasing the number of epochs. And here I'm showing you the histogram of the activation functions at layer one, 
So I've trained a deep feed forward neural network and I'm showing you what do the activations look like at layer one with and without batch normalization. So remember that we started with this intuition that without batch normalization, there would be this constant fluctuation and the data would seem to come from different distribution at every training instance, right? Whereas with, with, with batch normalization, you are ensuring that your data comes from zero mean unit variance distribution, right? And so that is one thing which I want to see. Another thing I want to see is that how does it affect training, right? So that's the animation that I'm going to show you. So focus on all these three things. I don't know how you'll do it, but focus on this, focus on this, and focus on this with two eyes, okay? Uh, so let's see. So you see what happened, right? So this, so now look at the focus on the leftmost figure. So that does not seem to change much with respect to its mean and variance, right? But if you look at the middle figure, that's constantly changing its mean and variance, right? And you see the effect on the training loss that the first one, which was with batch normalization, that converges faster as compared to the second one, right? Again, an empirical result. I'm not really proving that this will always happen, but this is what empirically we observe, okay? So this was the story that we covered from 1986 to 2006, where back propagation was already, was already discovered but was not working well. Then there was a spark in 2006 that showed that, okay, we could do some things to make training really work for deep neural networks, but maybe that something is not sacrosanct. We could try different things. What we tried at that time was unsupervised pre-training, which is almost non-existent now. But that led, that led to these thoughts that maybe this is because of optimization, generalization, regularization, activation functions, and so on, right? So there was a lot of research in these different areas. And that led to a lot of developments, which was better optimization algorithms, better regularization, better activation functions, better initializations, and batch normalization, right? So these, a few concepts that you have seen in the past few lectures, one being dropout, and the other being uh, weight initialization using this Xavier initialization or he initialization, and this batch normalization, right? This is something which is all prevalent, right? So this is something that you will see in all deep neural networks that get trained definitely in convolutional neural networks, and more often than not, even in recurrent neural networks, right? So these are the two most popular types of, of neural networks. So in both of these, you'll see that these ideas are regularly applied, and they always lead to more stable training or better generalization, right? So now this was all which happened till 2016 or 17. What has happened still since then? So there is still continuous research in designing better optimization methods. So as I said, after Adam, there was this Eve, which did not become very popular, but there's still people looking at better optimization methods, and there is something which has been developed on Adam and came out in December last year. Now, people have also started looking at data-driven initialization methods, right? So instead of having this fixed initialization, which is uh, drawn from a unit, uh, dist uh, which is drawn from a normal distribution and then just divided by the square root of n, why not think of data-driven initialization methods, right? So there are some works on that. Again, not very popular because most of the shelf things that you will try will not really do any data driven initialization. But if you really think that you are stuck at some point, then you could look at some of these works and see how they try to come up with initializations based on the data that you are dealing with. And now after batch normalization, there have been some other types of normalizations which have been proposed, which seem to work better than batch normalization. But largely, the stable configuration which has kind of prevalent is Adam in terms of optimization, Xavier or he initialization in terms of initialization, ReLU in terms of activation functions, uh, uh, what else is there? Batch normalization in terms of, uh, again, regularization plus initialization, and dropouts in terms of regularization, right? So these are roughly the key terms that you'll almost see in all the deep neural, deep neural network papers that you'll see, right? You'll always see when they describe their hyperparameters, they will say that this is how we initialized this, this is the dropout that we use, this is the batch normalization, and the training algorithm more often than not is going to be Adam, right? So we have seen some very crucial elements of training deep neural networks over the past two to three lectures, right? And now we'll build on these and we'll assume that this is what you're going to do. So now when I talk about newer networks like convolutional neural networks and so on, I'll not go back and tell you use Adam or use batch normalization. I'll assume that you already know these things and you'll try to train your networks using these tricks that we have learned, right? So the past couple of lectures have been about tips and tricks for deep neural networks. And from here on, in the next lecture, we'll move on to what?
word to vec, right? Because that's what you need for your assignment. So in the next lecture, we'll do word representations. So that's essentially seeing an application of feed forward neural networks. And from there on, we'll move on to convolutional units.